In 2010, a routine day of work in a Chilean mine turned into a nightmare when the entrance collapsed, trapping 33 miners underground for 69 days. As the world held its breath for the trapped miners, an amazing tale of survival and resilience unfolded. This is the Chilean mining incident. Located in Chile's Atacama region, the San Jose Mine, or Mina San Jose, appears as a small copper gold mining site. Beneath its surface lies a world filled with danger. From cave-ins to toxic fumes, the dangers of underground mining are well known and constant. Mining, though essential for obtaining valuable minerals, is far from a risk-free endeavor. The process involves delving into hazardous, hollow depths armed with heavy machinery, making it a dangerous occupation. Despite employing a small fraction of the global workforce, mining bears a disproportionate share of fatal accidents, reaching a staggering 8%. Warnings about dangerous conditions at CMSC mines were ignored before the terrible tragedy. The lack of regard for worker concern shows a structural problem with mine safety. Now, as one of the highest paid mines in South America, Chile deals with a dilemma. Larger mines rarely experience major accidents, while smaller operations often prioritize profit before safety. The fact that mines like San Jose pay more than safer mines while having a poor safety record shows the difference in safety requirements. On August 5, 2010, Luis Urzua, the mine supervisor, led his team on their usual long 12-hour shift. They were deep underground, about three miles from the entrance and 2,300 feet down. It seemed like just another day, until it wasn't. The noise of drills echoed through the narrow tunnels as the miners worked carefully, the air filled with dust and heat. They were situated in the central part of the mine, surrounded by various corridors and access points leading to other sections. When Urzua called for a break, the miners gathered at a junction point where two main tunnels intersected labeled as Corridor A and Corridor B on the mine map. They stopped to eat lunch, taking a brief break from their mining tasks. However, their moment of rest was quickly interrupted. Suddenly, they felt strong vibrations echoing through the walls, followed by an explosion that shook the whole mine. Choking dust filled the air, lowering visibility and causing panic among the miners. It felt as if the very earth was crumbling around them, and that's exactly what happened. A massive block of rock broke loose and crashed down through the layers of the mine, causing the entire mountain above to collapse. The walls of the mine weren't strong enough to hold, and disaster struck. There they were, 33 workers in total darkness for six hours, still stumbling from the shock of the terrifying situation they were in. They were lucky to be alive, but now they were trapped 2,300 feet below ground with almost no food or water. The situation was dire and their future was uncertain. The trapped miners immediately thought of the ventilation shafts as a potential escape route. However, their hopes were destroyed when they discovered that the shafts lacked ladders, a critical safety feature that mine management had neglected to install. On August 7th, a secondary collapse occurred within the mine, causing further damage and destruction. This collapse completely blocked access to the ventilation shafts, which had been considered a potential escape route for the miners. These ventilation shafts, which provided crucial airflow to the underground workings of the mine, were now inaccessible, further isolating the miners from potential rescue. Before the surface rescuers arrived on the scene, there were initial signs that something had gone wrong at the mine. Communication between the surface and the underground workings of the mine was disrupted following the collapse. This lack of communication raised alarm bells, as the miners failed to respond to attempts to contact them. The very next day after the secondary collapse on August 8th, they began drilling exploratory holes through the rock above the mine. By drilling these holes, rescuers hoped to establish contact with the miners by sending listening probes down the shafts to detect any signs of life below. They also aimed to assess the stability of the mine and gather information about the miners' location and condition. Unfortunately, the initial drilling efforts faced challenges including outdated and inaccurate mine maps, which made it difficult to accurately target the boreholes. The surface rescuers now held the key to the miners' fate. The local rescue squad showed up on the site shortly after the collision, ready to assist. It was impossible for them to break through a 770,000-ton stone block, 
no matter how hard they tried. As a matter of fact, the rescuers were not very optimistic that anyone within had survived the fall. News of the disaster reached the president of Chile on the same day. Immediately, he made the rescue of the miners the government's top priority. When the Minister of Mining arrived, he gave the state-owned mining corporation Codelco's experts charge of the rescue effort. The administration vowed to use all available resources to free the trapped miners. Rescuers faced immense challenges as they attempted to avoid the rockfall at the main entryway through alternate passages. However, each route they explored was either obstructed by fallen rock or endangered by ongoing rock movement. Following the collapse on August 7th, rescuers resorted to using heavy machinery in their efforts to gain access via a ventilation shaft. Concerns regarding the risk of triggering further geological movement compelled rescuers to refrain from further attempts to reach the trapped miners through existing shafts. Instead, they attempted to find alternate means to locate the men. The timing of the accident, coming on the heels of sharp criticism of the government's response to the Chilean earthquake and tsunami, exacerbated the situation. President Sebastian Piñera promptly cut short an official trip and returned to Chile to visit the mine in person. On August 19th, one of the probes finally reached a space where the miners were believed to be trapped. However, to the rescuer's surprise, no signs of life were detected, adding to the mounting sense of urgency and despair. Just when everyone was about to give up, on August 22nd, a breakthrough occurred with the 8th borehole, piercing through at a depth of 2,257 feet near the shelter where the miners had sought refuge. Days prior to this event, the miners had anxiously listened as the drills approached, preparing notes that they attached to the drill's tip using insulation tape. They also tapped on the drill before its withdrawal, the sound of which resonated on the surface. As the drill was retrieved, it carried a note that said, all 33 of us are fine in the shelter. Subsequently, video cameras lowered down the borehole and captured the first grainy black and white silent images of the miners. The miners had found refuge in an emergency shelter measuring 540 square feet, embedded with two long benches. However, ventilation issues forced them to relocate to a nearby tunnel. Additionally, they had access to approximately 1.2 miles of open tunnels, allowing them to move about and find some consolation or exercise. Despite severely limited food supplies, the men managed to stretch their resources through careful rationing sustaining themselves for two weeks until their discovery. Each man had lost an average of 18 pounds by the time they were found, which showed the severity of their situation. Following their frightening experience, miner Mario Sepulveda praised the unity and democratic underground approach. They protected the mine, looked for ways out, and raised spirits together. Sepulveda emphasized the need for cooperation, emphasizing the unity of the community as crucial to its existence. While the miners endured their hell underground, rescuers above ground were diligently formulating plans to extract them. Three different strategies, labeled plans A, B, and C, were devised, each employing different drills and drilling techniques. Plan A utilized an Australian-built Strata 950 model raise borer provided by South African mining company Murray & Roberts. This drilling rig, weighing 28 tons, had recently been used in the Andina copper mine in Chile. However, it encountered challenges due to its weight and the potential for rock debris to fall down the hole once it was bored. Plan C involved a Canadian-made Rig 421 oil drilling rig operated by Precision Drilling Corporation. This rig, typically used for oil and gas well drilling, faced difficulties in aiming accurately at the small target and experienced setbacks due to the hardness of the rock, causing the drill bit to wander. Ultimately, it was Plan B, led by SRAM Incorporated, T-130XD Air Corps drill owned by Geotech SA that succeeded in reaching the trapped miners first. This drill, equipped with specialized down-the-hole drilling hammers from Center Rock Incorporated, was directed to bore toward the workshop area accessible to the miners. It worked in three stages, enlarging the hole to eventually accommodate a capsule for the miners' rescue. Plan B's success was attributed to its careful planning, specialized equipment, and strategic approach. Their drilling efforts started on September 5th, exactly one month after the collapse. Over the course of several weeks, 
The team painstakingly drilled a 28-inch wide hole at an angle of 82 degrees, linking the surface with a workshop inside the mine. To reduce the risk of further collapse, the drilling process was conducted in three stages, relieving pressure on the drill bit. Throughout this difficult task, the trapped miners worked tirelessly in shifts to clear debris left by the drilling operation. Finally, on October 9, 2010, the Plan B hole was completed. A specially designed capsule named Phoenix 2 and decorated with the colors of the Chilean national flag was transported to the site in preparation for the rescue. Three days later, on October 12, the San Lorenzo rescue operation commenced. Named after the miner's patron saint, the operation began at 2318 hours with the descent of the Phoenix capsule. Manuel Gonzalez, a seasoned rescue worker, descended first to coordinate the operation from within the mine. The first miner to ascend to the surface was Florencio Avalos, Rizua's deputy, chosen for his exceptional skills in case of any complications with the capsule. At 011 hours on October the 13th, after spending 69 horrifying days trapped underground, he emerged into the open air. Welcomed by the strains of the national anthem and embraced by the president of Chile, Avalos rejoined his family amidst a crowd of miners' relatives who had anxiously awaited their loved one's return. The entire rescue operation, as well as the captivating saga, was broadcast worldwide. The last miner to be extracted at 2155 was Luis Arzua. After all, what had started off as a nightmare became a ray of hope. That being said, the aftermath was anything but peaceful for many of the miners. Even though the older miners received lifetime pensions and six months of health care, their trauma remained long after the cameras stopped recording. A large number of them turned to drinking and drugs as they struggled with the fallout from their experience. While for others, the brief popularity gave place to personal struggles. In the meantime, the people who owned the San Jose mine which was the main cause of the accident, escaped major consequences. They avoided facing legal action for their disregard for worker safety, even though they had to sell their company to pay the substantial $20 million rescue expenses. Although the mine was closed following the accident, the government transformed the area into a poignant tourist attraction in 2015. Visitors to the site are greeted by a solemn yet hopeful sight, a hillside adorned with 33 flags, each representing one of the miners who went through the terrifying situation. Do you have any other stories you'd like to hear about? Feel free to share in the comments below. See you next time.